Go get it, Daisy. Go get it. Go get it. <laughs> Go get it. Where are you going? You hiding that toy? Give that back. Give that toy back. Wow, it is nice and sunny out. All right, we got to get over to that flea market and do some birthday treasure hunting. All right, wish me luck. <laughs> All right, everyone, we are back. I'm real excited. We're going to go and do my first ever birthday treasure hunt. So let's head over to the flea market for the first flea market hunt of 2020 and see what treasures await us. All right, we're here and there's still a little bit of snow on the ground some snow piles but there's also a fair amount of cars now it's not filled up like it normally is and that's because it's still in the 30s it's 39 degrees and it's supposed to warm up to 60 61 which is why i thought you know what let's give the flea market a shot today well, as you can see here, I am met with empty spaces as soon as I arrived, and that was to be a bad sign, a bad omen for the rest of the day. Typically, you see vendors set up as soon as you arrive, and when you go under this roof area over here, um, you know, you can see there, there's where the cars park, but uh, that's where they are unloading their merchandise uh, to set up their tables and their booths and stuff, and... Uh, typically, you see vendors set up all along uh, each side of this strip. There's a couple of uh, food uh, truck areas as well. You can see those are closed. So even though it was supposed to be in the 60s uh, later on during the day, uh, it, was just, uh, it was just dead outside. There really just wasn't anyone there. Now, I went inside the initial uh, vestibule area here, and there were a few vendors set up, but the few things that I checked out that they had uh, you know was worth looking at just it was just overpriced or there were pieces missing items damaged uh, just just wasn't worth it and a lot of empty space now this is the vestibule that's always open and uh, all year round it's it's filled with with people on a sunday and so this area drew my attention you can see there it says ephemeris which refers to ephemera. So these are paper products that were not designed to last for a long time, yet here they are. Uh, and so I started to take a look, and this one, the world of Pogo, is a, is a good item. Anytime you see anything with Pogo, it's this cartoon character whose uh, uh, mission is to help save the environment. And there are collectors that like Pogo stuff. So, you know, this looks like almost like one of those fanzines that I've shown you before for comic books, but you see any of these old black and white uh, foldable paper products like that, those are things that are worth picking up. So what I'm going to do with you here in this video is show you kind of how to go through uh, ephemera paper stacks like this. Now, you will come across bumper stickers, political bumper stickers, political items like this. A mistake people make is thinking that these are all valuable because they have famous politicians' names on them. They're not always valuable. And that's a good example, the Reagan and Bush bumper stickers. I mean, you may be able to get like seven bucks out of one of them, but the problem with these is that there's creases on them. And as you can see there, there are stains. So I am leaving those behind. Uh, political pictures are uh, sometimes good to pick up. Depends uh, who it is that you come across. What I look for in pictures like this is not just a generic picture, like a portrait. I look more for something like this that conveys emotion. You could see Rockefeller there, and um, you know, and Nixon. So you know, really, really cool, uh, really, really cool picture there. So that would have been one that I would have picked up as opposed to those other more more generic ones. Uh, now, if any of this stuff starts looking familiar to you or when it starts looking familiar to you, if you've watched some of my older videos, let me know because uh, that's going to play into uh, what happened here today. You can see there's a lot of damaged stuff here, uh, but you got to dig to the bottom because as you can see here, a lot of people would just pass this up, but sometimes you got to pull things out, get to the bottom and take a closer look because if you look here, what you see, and I like the colors on these are nice and bright. Uh, these happen to be mostly Scooby-Doo uh, film strips, 
and I have uh, purchased these uh, before. Um, not literally this this particular Scooby Doo one, but uh, film strips before Warner Brothers ones, um, Hanna Barbera ones. Uh, they are uh, popular. Collectors do like them. They do tend to sell best in lots. And so what I would have done uh, is uh, get these, put them together in lots, like put the Scooby-Doo ones together, uh, sell those. And then um, you're going to see there's uh, another uh, cartoon here as well, which will be familiar to many of you from back in the day. Um, let's get past these Scooby-Doo's in a second. But you're going to see uh, Yogi Bear is going to come uh, in just a moment. But there, there's a bunch of them. There is also a part one and a part two of the Scooby-Doo's. There we go. There's some Yogi Bears right there. And um, so I would have put like a little Yogi Bear lot together and a little, um, little Scooby-Doo lot. Uh, there was some damage on the top of some of these. I mean, nothing that would make me not get it, but something that you'd want to uh, disclose. Uh, you'll see that on, um, I think this one over here might, might have it on there. Uh, but, you know, you just got to be careful about that. Make sure it's not ripped or anything or, or you know, like make sure there's not like a big crease going across it. You could see up top there, uh, there's a little damage there on, on that one. So, you know, just something to note. Uh, so anyway, little film strips like this, make sure you look out for them, uh, pick them up. As you could see, they could hide. They could be very easy to miss. And another point is that when you're looking through paper lots like this, it's inevitable that there are going to be other things that are hidden in these paper lots besides paper items. So you will see film strips like this. Uh, you might occasionally find a small record. You might find some small toys. You might find small games. You might find uh, little stamp-like products like this. These are, these are definitely old right here. Um, they're already attached, so that makes it a little bit trickier to sell them but uh, the ones on the bottom were cool i would have just thrown this whole thing in the box because um you know you could see there's some military ones there so th those were interesting in terms of that type of animation uh so uh continuing to uh, dig through you know you really have to go piece by piece through the stuff um and sometimes things i've talked about this before that look boring you need to take a look at like this right here, the Laconian. Uh, this actually is an old yearbook uh, from Lowville, uh, New York, uh, which isn't too far away from uh, me here in Syracuse. And even though it's not a major city or anything like that, there are still people that are from there that and in other small cities throughout the country that will look up uh, to see if they could find an old yearbook uh, from either when they went there or from when a parent went there and they'll want to purchase it. Uh, so I look through these just to make sure uh, there's not any significant damage or anything, you know, really bad moisture exposure or something like that. But one of the other things I like to look for are things like this. If I could see any handwriting in there that makes it a little bit uh, more personal. If I could find any signatures by people who used to uh, go to the school, you know, there's people who, of course, sign the yearbooks. Uh, I look for that as well. Compelling pictures. Like here you can see here, there's a gentleman who uh, signed uh, signed that page and there's uh, some other people who signed, uh, signed the pages as well. I also like to look at the style of dress. Uh, these are things that I would try to highlight if there was uh, a particular uh, person or group of people on a page that, you know, looked more interesting, more compelling faces, more compelling... Um, a style of dress to highlight that would be something you know good in terms of picking one to photograph or picking a couple. Uh, same with uh, if you had a page that had more signatures than another, I'd put that on there as well. Uh, you will have family members inquire and say, "Hey, is my relative in this yearbook?" Because you know, if so, I'd like to purchase it. Uh, so take you know take a look into yearbooks. Uh, you could also take the city type it into your phone, look up the Wikipedia entry for it, and it will tell you about notable people. And if you find a notable person went to that school, look and see if you could find them in there. That's a way to find uh, famous people uh, from your books. So that's something I'll do as well. Here's a great example. When I find books like this with nothing on the outside, nothing on the binding, nothing on the back, nothing on the front, to me, this is ripe for a nice treasure pick because you, this is stuff that a lot of people will just pass up and miss because it doesn't say what it is on the outside. Now, there's a little stamp on the inside, but that's really not giving it away much. 
what you see in here that you should look for are blueprints. Now, keep in mind, I emphasize this over and over again, you might have zero interest in blueprints, but you don't need to. You just need to, to recognize it and look up top. There you go. You see there's a bunch of uh, railroad insignia up there. If you see any blueprints related to railroads, definitely pick them up. I went to an estate sale once where the attic was crammed with these types of things, and I just picked all of them up, and they all sold, and they usually sell pretty fast. Uh, people love this stuff with the railroad switches, and if you could date it back uh, you know, to the 1930s, 1940s, you know, if you have a nice vintage piece on your hand like this, I highly suggest looking into it. Uh, also, you know, you could see here, you could extend out some of the blueprints. And these are things that I would highlight in my listing. I would take pictures of an extended blueprint. I would take pictures of uh, that little caption there on the on the bottom right, uh, just to highlight that this is you know something from a railroad. Um, you know, uh, you know, just just to make sure I give people a good sampling of what it is that's that's in this book. Don't just you know take one picture. Take a couple of pictures of something like this to give people a really good idea of what it is. And uh, this would be um, a, a guaranteed flip uh, for sure. So that would be one I would uh, toss into the box to get. And just to give you a little bit of an overview here, this is what the table uh, looks like right now. But then as I turn over, I start to see some more stuff. So is this looking familiar to anybody yet? Does anybody recognize any of this stuff from, hint, hint, from a prior video? We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so uh, it does come from a prior uh, video that wound up here at the flea market. So that story will be an unfolding one. But uh, you know, you got to go through this stuff piece by piece. That's um, one of the strategies I would I would tell you. Don't just do like a quick skim through it. Uh, really, really look through. If you find postcards, anything with Santa Claus on it, I would pick up. But you could see the problem on the back of that Santa card. Even though people will buy for the front, uh, that one really is pretty damaged on the on the back, which would decrease some of the value on it. Some cool Western stuff. Anytime I find these oversized items. Uh, like this, like with an oversized piece of lumber, oversized corn or fruit or foods. I pick them up. I find people like those. So I, I like to get those. Uh, here's a good example of some of the damage of things in this lot. So uh, keep in mind that, that you know, you're going to find a lot of damage. This is a cool piece right here. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite things that I found here. And I want you to pay attention to the type of uh, writing that you see on the front and just the design of that cover because that is really a dead giveaway that it's something that would be collectible. It, it's a dead giveaway that it is vintage just because of the look and feel of it. And it's something that you just have to gain uh, with experience in terms of being able to recognize that that's something that would be collectible. Anything that has to do with machinery, uh, I've talked about this before, uh, there are people out there that just love this stuff. They love to add it to their shop. They love to add it to their uh, man cave. They might even want to display that uh, cover. They use things like this as reference. Uh, people just love this type of stuff. So uh, you'd want to take a picture not only of the outside cover, but uh, also of some of these uh, you know, pages on the, on the inside as well, just to give people a sense of what is in there. So don't just take a picture of the cover. I see a lot of people make that mistake. Uh, you have to unfold things. So you could see here when I unfold this, I find a check. Look who wrote the check. You know, you might not recognize the name. Look who it's written to, but you might find that it's someone who's famous. Now they might not be super famous. This one here is um, Howard Driggs, and Howard Driggs is a he's an author. He's written over fifty books. A lot of them were on the Oregon Trail. There's a school named after him in, in Utah. There's people who still buy stuff uh, that are How Howard Driggs related, and people will buy things that he signed, including checks. Um, checks are a great way uh, to find things that have been signed by celebrities. Not that Howard Driggs is a, a celebrity, but you will find things. You will find, for example, uh, something that Frank Sinatra might have written uh, out, or, you know, or Marlon Brando. I know that sounds rare, but uh, there are things like this that do come up from time to time. And I found a lot of those checks around, so uh, I cut them out of the video in terms of other times. 
but I just kind of scooped them all up. You could see there what I'm doing is I'm showing you quadrants, uh, or actually more than quadrants. I actually broke it up into six different pieces there, are six different areas, um, because that's what you have to do when you go through stuff. You need to make uh, distinct zones to look through to make something that seems overwhelming less overwhelming. So break things up into chunk chunks. Uh, chunking is what I call it. Uh, this here, you can see it says gimbals on the front. It kind of reminds me of Miracles on uh, 34th Street with the gimbals department store competing with Macy's. Uh, but that's gimbal stamp book and uh, people like those. So you can pick those up if they're vintage. Uh, there's some more postcards here. Uh, that one is pretty cool. I really like the art on the front, although there's nothing on the back uh, of this one, which is... Um, you know, I, I like to see that there's usually like a divided back on it, uh, but, you know, with like a line uh, to be able to date it better. Uh, this one here is a nice little card. Uh, looks like a trade card here. Uh, but you can see here again, look at the damage on the back. That's going to take away some of the collectability of it. But uh, the front is still nice. And so for someone who just wants it for displaying the front, that's uh, that's a cool piece. These are what are called Sunday sheets. So they're Sunday comic uh, sheets. So anyone who likes comics, you know, I specialize in comic books. I love this type of stuff. And this is Prince Valiant. If you remember back to the Mile High series that I did, and if you haven't checked it out, make sure you go look. Um, Chuck Rosansky and his wife uh, um, collect Prince Valiant stuff. And they have Prince Valiant's sword for display. And that was something that uh, he said he had a not for sale sign on it for symbolic reasons. So go check out that video if you want. Uh, now, those Sunday sheets don't go for a ton, but if you could combine it with something like this, which is like, um, you know, something from the 1970s and which was advertising some Prince Valiant uh, products, and there were some other comic book characters uh, in here as well. Uh, there was Flash Gordon. Uh, you could see the Phantom here as well. Again, kind of has that old fanzine kind of look, fanzine look to it. So what I would have done here is I would have combined the Sunday sheet with this and uh, tried to make a combined sale, uh, just adding value uh, for the buyer on uh, on that item. So uh, again, you know, make sure you're unfolding things uh, when you look through these paper lots because that's how you're going to find things hidden within them and realize what is actually uh, folded up in there. Um, again, keep looking at postcards, and if you find anything that is train-related, uh, definitely pick it up. Anything railroad-related, rail uh, pick it up, uh, because um, railroad items, train items are collectible for sure, and there are a bunch of other ones. Now, this one here... Uh, this one, there's no comps on. Sometimes you have to go by instinct. And whenever I see, anim not animation, but if I see um, drawings or pictures of uh, Santa Claus or um, any art involving characters from the holidays, um, you could see there was like the Easter bunny and, uh, you know, a character with like a pumpkin for a head. You know, anything resembling, uh, you know, holiday characters, I, I, if it's vintage, I like to look into picking it up. Now, unfortunately, inside there are some pieces of, of, of paper that are loose, but um, I thought that someone might be interested in that for the cover and not so much the inner contents. And so as long as it looks complete, something worth looking into and picking up. Uh, old newspapers, you're going to see a lot of those around. Um, you know, you got to be careful with which ones you pick up because even for older newspapers, um, there's still tons of them around that people saved and, and hoarded. And so uh, there's a lot of them on the market. But, you know, if you could find one from a famous newspaper like there, New York Times, Nixon Resigns, that's one that would be worth uh, picking up. Now, if you just found the one below it that says Nixon uh, resigns, uh, which was not from as famous of, uh, of a paper, that one's from the Reno Evening Gazette, um, you know, I wouldn't have just picked that one up. But if you combine them both, com both together like that, that's a good idea. Um, this one here, you could see it's, rail it's a railway uh, corporation. These are like order sheets. There's a bunch of them in there. There's a lot of them. Uh, so I would pick those up as well. People are interested in these vintage order sheets. And if they could link it to a specific railroad like that, people from the area will like to uh, pick them up as well. Also, one other thing with newspapers, if the newspaper tells you that something is going to happen, like Nixon is going to resign, 
that's not as valuable as if, as in the one that says Nixon did resign. So be careful of that. You, there's another example of some of these rail, railroad uh, postcards. And that, by the way, is a real uh, photo postcard there. You could see the, the shine on it right there. It looks like an actual photograph. They're black and white uh, typically, and they usually have like a little bit of, of white writing on the bottom. Not always, but sometimes. And so uh, those are very popular, uh, sell very well. Uh, people love uh, real photo postcards. But there was only one of them that I found uh, across this entire lot. And you can see this is a big paper lot. So again, I'm going to say, are those boxes of paper looking familiar to you yet? I will reveal this uh, pretty soon in terms of where this came from when you see this right here. Remember these farmer almanacs, okay? Uh, these were at a prior estate sale video that I did a couple weeks ago called Estate Sale Fail. So similar to this one, which you'll find out why soon. Um, but the prices per box for these farmer almanacs, some of them were hundreds of dollars, like $300, $600. It was crazy. And now here they all are at a flea market. So keep in mind that all these things, including you know this right here, were all from a prior estate sale. All this stuff didn't sell. So it's all been picked through and hasn't sold. So here it winds up here at the flea market. I thought these were cool, these 10-pound turkey items, these cardboard items where you punch out a, a person's name and you could get a turkey for a certain price uh, depending on what number you get and what your name is. Uh, the problem I had with them, though, that would make them a little tricky to sell is that they were not linked to a particular uh, company, like it wasn't Purdue or you know anything like that. It was just you know very generic, just something that they would put in a store, um, but not linked to a specific store. So these were probably sent out to stores all across the country who wanted to run like a promo like that. Um, but it does take away a little bit from it if you don't have a, um, a company name to link it to. These are um, bridge playing pieces. So if you ever come across these, there's all different designs that you could find on them. These are all Mexican related. They weren't in the best condition. Like some of them had some damage on the back, but uh, not all of them. Um, they were fairly well preserved in there. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, you can see there's a sombrero there. You, you will find that with these paper lots that things just basically become uh, nestled uh, within layers and they become protected. They're almost, almost kind of like fossils in a way on how fossils could get layered under the ground and protected between, you know, two pieces and preserved over time. That happens a lot with items that you find in these paper lots. So um, this would be something I would uh, pick up and just toss in the box and, you know, hopefully, you know, just get everything for one solid big uh, bulk price. So, you know, that's how it works. Look for little uh, cards like this, anything that looks vintage, um, nice, you know, nice art in there, nice color. You know, you're looking for things with bright colors, um, you know, that are older, that have an older art style to it. People still buy old greeting cards and things like that. Um, there you could see, um, the, uh, reason why you want to dig and look through stuff and you've got to look through layers because there's more of those checks. But then also if you look here, uh, again, you see a bunch of these, um, different postcards that are here. And so, you know, it would be up to you what you would want to do with these postcards, probably be, um, most, uh, cost efficient to just sell these off as a lot. Although you may be able to, uh, to piece them out, uh, as well, particularly, um, or you might want to pull a couple of them out if they were from like a really, really, you know, famous, uh, railway or rail line that, um, you know, people would pay up a little bit more for, but there, you know, there's some pretty cool ones in here, uh, that I liked. And so, um, you know, ultimately after going through all the boxes and that's another tip, you, know, you see something in one box, make sure you look into other ones because they could spill over into other boxes. Like I say, when there's smoke, there's fire. So, you know, a lot of those checks were in different boxes. Um, and a lot of these postcards were in different boxes as well. And there was a lot of political uh, memorabilia here uh, as well. But, you know, keep in mind with the political memorabilia, uh, again, that, 
remember, for things like bumper stickers, those things were made in mass amounts to send out all across the country uh, for people. So there were major stockpiles of these things. And so a lot of people still uh, have those stockpiles around and really, really decreases the value uh, of it. You'll see another example of it in a minute. I point to that one because that one I specifically remember from the prior estate sale. Uh, and this here, this is an example of us talking about with the bumper stickers. I mean, just look at all these President Ford 76 bumper stickers. These are really worthless. Uh, nobody wants anything like this. Uh, no one is clamoring clamoring or nostalgic for President Ford. And that's not a political statement. It's just a factual statement. Wow. So that did not go as planned. I definitely have the birthday curse going on today. Not only was there barely any vendors set up outside and those who were set up, there's like one or two people. They didn't even have anything worth sourcing. Then in that initial shed area, while there were a few vendors set up, everything was overpriced. Then I went into that last shed in which they have stuff set up there all year round. Um, but as you saw, I spent the majority of my time uh, going through all of those paper items to try to put together a vintage paper lot like I have done at so many other estate sales and at the flea market many times before. Now, if Don, the auction professor, is watching this or other people out there who source vintage paper lots like this at these types of places, uh, they will tell you that a stack of paper like that uh, that you are doing pick and pull style will generally be somewhere around 20 bucks. And sometimes you could even get it for less than that. Now, some people may pay up a little bit more than that, but right around $20 is where I would say uh, that would be at. So um, it didn't take me long going through that paper lot to figure out that they must have done some type of a big uh, sourcing purchase uh, from some other vendor because they normally don't have a paper uh, selection like that. Um, they usually have more like a lot of tools and kind of like random home items. There's some books once in a while, but nowhere near that extent of paper uh, product. And so as I was going through it, I started to see things that look uh, more familiar. Once I saw those farmer's almanacs, I knew that this was items that came from that uh, total estate sale fail video that I put up a few weeks back. Now, if you didn't see that one, I'm gonna put a link to it at the end of this video. Go check that out if you didn't see it before, but if you did, you remember it. Everyone who commented on it agreed that those prices were completely insane and totally out of line uh, for something that you know, really, even for collectors, like some of the prices were way too high. Um, but certainly for someone who's a reseller, there was just not money to be made at that place at all. In fact, if you remember me saying many of my reselling colleagues in the area were walking out before I even got in there, just shaking their head. And some of them were even just laughing empty handed because the prices were just sky high. Now, there was a follow-up to that estate sale that I did not go to uh, because of what happened the first day. And on that day, that person was gonna open up the basement area where there were gonna be more boxes of vintage paper. And if you remember from that sale, the person who lived there uh, had an interest in a lot of uh, political type of stuff. So that's why you saw some of the political things that you saw there uh, today. Uh, so uh, that person was obviously not able to sell a ton of that stuff because the prices were so high. So what did he do afterwards? He went around and shopped it to people and he wound up selling it to these flea market vendors. Now, I'll talk to you about that some more as I uh, get through the story of what happened when I went to check out. So normally what happens in a checkout situation like this is that you bring the box up or you bring your pile up and when it's paper items like this, since the dealers generally don't know anything about this type of stuff, they just look at it and they eyeball it and they say, eh, all right, you know, 15 bucks, 10 bucks. Some will even say five bucks, 20 bucks, something like that. That's what they normally will do. Well, what this person started to do is to take every item out of the box, every postcard, every tiny piece of paper and start going like this. Hmm. Hmm. And every book opening up, 
looking through every single thing. I don't know if she thought like I was stuff stuff in there or, or something, which I never do by the way. But anyway, you know, just going through every single thing, looking at it, analyzing it. And I know that this person knows nothing about this stuff. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, um, she looks at me and she says, well, that's going to be $70. And like, she says it like almost like aggressively, like it's $70. And I said, there's just, you know, I nicely, I said, there's just no way I could do that. I can't do $70 on it. She's like, well, well, that's the best I could do is $70. Uh, she goes like, that's less than a dollar a piece. And I can't do any better than that. And I said, I know that you got this stuff from so-and-so. I'm not going to say his name on the video, but I said, I know you got this stuff from so-and-so. And as soon as I said that, that triggered her and she said, yeah, and I paid thousands of dollars to him and I need to get my money back. And you know, so you see, that was her big mistake. She spent thousands of dollars to buy mostly worthless stuff. So there was a lot of stuff there. Yes, I did pick out some good things that I would have been able to resell, uh, however, amongst all of that was a lot of junk, a lot of damaged items. You saw some of the stuff that I turned over. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was beat up and a lot of stuff that just wasn't worth anything. Like part of the, those thousands of dollars that she spent was on a lot of those, uh, like for example, that big bag of like President Ford bumper stickers, which is you know worthless. So there's a lot of that stuff there. Uh, look how damaged some of those farmers almanacs were. So she claims she spent thousands of dollars on this. And so now what's going on is she's trying to um, you know, get her money back by inflating the prices uh, on her customers. The problem for her is she's trying to do that in a flea market setting. That's a big problem because setting does play a role. Um, while normally I could get very good deals at a state sales, um, you know, you're going to pay a little bit more at a state sale than you are at a flea market or a garage sale. People are not going to flea markets or garage sales to play, to pay, uh, retail prices or to pay jacked up prices, especially if it's in a pick and pull situation like this, where you need to do all the work. She did not have everything sorted. I mean, as much as you want to say about in that video, the, the total estate sale fail video, where things were really jacked up in terms of prices, at least that guy had the stuff somewhat organized into sections. In this, there was nothing like that. So when you have to go through it, and that guy had it priced per box. So this, there's no price on it, it's pick and pull. Pick and pull is your deepest discount. So just keep that in mind if anyone ever tries to jack the prices up on you like this lady tried to do. So, you know, it's the same type of concept as if you go into a buffet as opposed to a sit down uh, restaurant with a waiter and waitress. You may get the same exact types of food, uh, but you're gonna pay less at the buffet because you're the one who has to go up and serve yourself and pick out what you want. You don't have uh, someone who's coming over and getting you seconds and, you know, making sure your meal is, you know, prepared exactly properly. You go up and you do all that stuff yourself, so you pay a lower price. So that's the same type of business a concept that should be going on here. Evidently, uh, that hasn't that message has not gone through everybody. So, um, you know, I, I told her I couldn't do that. She was not even willing to negotiate at all because what I again calmly tried to explain to her is that when I buy bulk vintage paper items like this, I pay a lot price. And again, I got this nasty reaction that, well, this is a lot price. And I said, well, no, it's not a lot price because you went through every single item individually and then you gave me a price. So she's like, well, if you want me to go through them and price them individually, I'll price them individually for you. And then I'll give you a price that costs more than $70. And at that point, I just said, well, you know, I'm sorry we can't make a deal, but I am not uh, paying for this. And so uh, I put it back down and then I just walked away. And so not only will I not purchase that, but I will not go back and return to that uh, vendor again. So their loss, I do believe in customer service. And when you treat your customers terribly like that, um, you know, you also have to keep in mind, I didn't mention this, but I have gone to that vendor in the past and I have made purchases before. So it's not like, you know, they don't know who I am or anything like that. You know, it's not like I buy something every week, but I have made purchases there before. 
So um, just gonna cut that out of my list uh, when I go back next time and just focus my time on other places. Um, to try to turn a, you know, a positive out of this, um, at least I was able to go through and film stuff for you in terms of the things that you should look for when you are looking for paper items. But remember, especially if you're doing pick and pull, you need to be able to get that stuff for a nice bulk price, a cheap price, like right around 20 bucks where you could really, really make good money on. That's why Don and I always talk about we have pennies invested into these things because that's typically uh, what you could get them for. Um, now, one last point to mention is that this is the advantage of having a lot of inventory because it gives you leverage in these types of situations. It allows you to just walk away from the deal and still have a smile on your face because you know you still have tons of product. This stuff is just like bonus to me if I was able to pick it up. It would be like a cherry on top of the sundae, but I don't need it. I have tons of other stuff to you know go back to Primetime Treasure Headquarters and list. Um, so, and you know, the other good thing about it again was being able to do the video. So try to turn a positive uh, out of a negative situation. I went over and I normally don't do this, but it's my birthday, so why not indulge? I got a cheesesteak with onions, I already wolfed that down. I got a Mountain Dew. I'm gonna go back home, spend some time with Daisy and the fam. Gonna go out to dinner tonight, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, hopefully uh, we could uh, get things back on track uh, the next time that we come over to the flea market and have a better experience. But I'm gonna wait till the weather definitely warms up a bit more uh, so we could uh, ensure that we're gonna have some outside vendors to deal with next time. Uh, until then, thank you everybody for the birthday wishes here uh, on this channel in the comments and also in my Facebook group. I really appreciate it. Come by the Facebook group, by the way. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, we've got over 16,000 members there. It's the Facebook Reselling Resource Center. Make sure you hit the like button. Um, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're not subscribed, it's going to be a fun treasure hunting year. And uh, follow me on Instagram. That's at prime underscore time underscore treasure. I'll see you back at the next video, everyone. Take care. Thanks for the happy birthday wishes, Daisy. All right, let's go get some cake. How's that sound? <laughs>